Okay, here we are continuing chapter eight with section 8.4, trigonometric identities. Now I did previously um, attempt to record this, but then I received an error and my program shut down. So um, you're gonna see everything kind of written down already, but we're gonna go ahead and go through it anyway, just so that I can explain everything that's there. So it says, in previous sections, the Pythagorean theorem identity sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one was developed. What makes this equation an identity? Just like every person has his or her own identity in mathematics, we say that an equation is an identity if it maintains its value for every value input received. So essentially what that's saying is that the left-hand side of the equation will always equal the right-hand side of the equation, no matter what the value of the variable is. And in this equation, the identity equation, um, theta is our variable. So no matter what theta is, the left-hand side of this equation should equal the right-hand side of this equation. And so then they were asking us for sine of 35 degrees. Now I did go ahead and do that in my calculator. I had it in degree mode. And so then I had it in degree mode. But I had it in degree mode and I typed in sine of 35, cosine squared 35, and I did hit enter and it did give me one. And then I did the same thing for five pi over three. So I did sine of five pi over three. You cannot put the square here like it is on the paper. So I do have to put the sine of this angle in parentheses and then square it. Okay, so that's important when you're trying to put these in your calculator that you put that in there correctly. Um, and then I hit enter and I got one. So make sure when you're trying to do sine squared of five pi over three that you're typing in sine of five pi over three, the computer will automatically open a parentheses for sine. You're gonna have to close it, but then you're gonna have to put another one to square everything. You do not want to write sine of five pi over three with a square here. That's gonna square the five pi over three and not the value of what you get after you've taken the sine, okay? And there's no way um to put sine squared in your calculator and then open the parentheses so be very very careful in the calculator and make sure that you're putting the whole sign of the angle in parentheses and then squaring it okay so um <clears throat> it says because the left hand side equals the right hand side and we've established that identity there that means that the graph of sine squared plus cosine squared should equal one, which means it'll look like a horizontal line at the y value, y equal to one. Okay, and so then I've gone ahead and drawn it over here. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and then I have a horizontal line there um, through the y value of one. So what makes it, what makes an identity equation different from another equation? And a regular equation is not an identity. An equation that is not an identity is called a conditional equation. And there's actually another kind of equation as well. We'll talk about that in just a tiny bit. So for example, two times X minus three equals five is only true. The left-hand side will equal the right-hand side only when X equals pi, uh, 11 over two. So that means that this equation is only conditionally true if X equals this specific value. Now sine of X equal to zero is also true for specific values of X, except there's actually an infinite number of X that satisfy it. Um, any multiple of pi, okay? So at zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, all of those, and even the negatives, negative pi, negative two pi, negative three pi, negative four pi, so on and so forth. Um, they're all multiples of pi and they're all solutions. So if it has one solution, it is, or a finite number of solutions, it's a conditional equation. 
if it has an infinite number of solutions, but not everything is a solution, then it's also a conditional equation. Now, if everything is a solution, any number you can think of is a solution, then it's called an identity. And if there's no solutions at all, then it's called the contradiction equation. Okay, so those are the, the three different kinds of equations you're gonna see. Identity, which is true no matter what X is. Conditional, which is only true for certain X's, either a finite number or a specific type of infinite numbers um, and then contradiction and before we get into the rest of this identity situation we want to go back and just kind of revamp on these formulas here because you may need them as you work through this section um, i don't think i came across any of these in this section but that doesn't mean that they can't happen okay um, and when i was recording i did get cut off from the last um example no i didn't i finished the whole thing so i really didn't use any of the negative even odd identities but that doesn't mean that you won't or that you won't see it okay um mostly we just use these three and then of course our pythagorean identities so let's go ahead and go into the section and see what we've got here so for the first example there's basically three yeah about three different um strategies that you can use to solve or to um establish an identity when they say establish an identity it's the same thing as saying that proving an equation is an identity okay it's just basically you're showing that with some algebraic manipulation um one statement is equivalent to another statement okay no matter what the angle is okay and the way we do that is by using um these identities that they've given us here so we know that these things are true no matter what the angle is so when i use these to go from one line to the next i automatically know that the solutions to the previous equation are the exact same solutions to the other equation and then therefore um still keeping that same value. So the first one here, the first strategy we have is to multiply by a well-chosen one. This one comes in handy, okay? Sometimes we may choose to multiply by sine over sine. Sometimes we may choose to multiply by cosine over cosine or tangent over tangent, it just depends on the problem. But a lot of times when you have a numerator or a denominator that has a binomial, and these guys are not squared, what you're gonna end up doing is multiplying by the conjugate so that you can eventually apply a Pythagorean identity, okay? So since I have a binomial in my denominator, we went ahead and took the conjugate of that denominator on minus cosine, multiplied it on top and bottom. Now, I know, I know from experience that when i'm doing this it's because i want to turn this into an identity which means eventually it'll turn into signs and then i'll be able to cancel the sign i can foresee that okay so because i can foresee it i worked out the problem this way okay so i left the sign on the outside i did not distribute it to the other um, numerator but i did go ahead and multiply this denominator out and when i foil this all out the two middle terms will cancel positive cosine and negative cosine leaving me with just two terms, one minus cosine squared theta. Then I change the one using the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is the same as one, so I use that identity. And then minusing the cosine squared, those can cancel and I can end up with just sine squared in the denominator. I knew this was gonna happen, I could foresee it, which is why I did not factor, I did not distribute the sign. So then this sign cancels with one of these signs, so all I'm left with is one minus cosine in the numerator and um, so one minus cosine in the numerator and sine in the denominator. Then what I did was I took and separated the fraction. So I did one over sine theta minus cosine over sine theta. And then this is 
the reciprocal identity, so it's cosecant. This is uh, a quotient identity, which means it's cotangent, okay? Um, but the, I didn't fact distribute the sign because I foresaw what was gonna happen. If you are not going to foresee or you don't foresee what's supposed to be happening, it's perfectly okay to distribute that sign. If I had chosen to distribute that sign, I would have ended up with sine times one, which is sine, sine times cosine, which is sine cosine. Then you can also use the identity the way I did, where I turned the one into sine squared plus cosine squared, and then these guys canceled, leaving me with sine squared. Or you can manipulate your sine squared plus cosine squared equals one identity. And if I take that identity and I minus cosine squared on both sides, I end up with sine squared equal to one minus cosine squared. So I know that one minus cosine squared, according to manipulation of this identity, that denominator is equivalent to sine squared. So whether you're plugging in for one and then canceling terms, or whether you're manipulating the identity, you'll still get to the same place, okay? Then from here, I do have two terms in the numerator, so I split it sine over sine squared, sine cosine over sine squared, and then I reduce this, I got one over sine, reduce this, I got one cosine over sine, and then this is still cosecant and this is still cotangent. So you can still get there even if you do not foresee what should be happening, okay? It is still possible um, to arrive at the same conclusion. Now, the second um, strategy is to, if you're given multiple fractions, is to rewrite as one, um, as one fraction. And so sometimes if they don't have a common denominator already, you will have to multiply by a well-chosen one to figure out how to make them um, have a common denominator, okay? So for instance, in this case, you have two separate fractions. So the common denominator between two totally different fractions is going to be these two things multiplied together, which means for the first fraction, I would have to multiply by one plus sine theta over one plus sine theta so that I had both of them in the denominator when I was done, okay? So really there's like an extra step that I didn't write down. And that would be just to put this times this with this in the numerator. Then here, for this fraction, we have to multiply um, by the other denominator, which is one minus sine over one minus sine. And then again, the denominator will become these two multiplied, the numerator just becomes one minus sine theta. If I FOIL these out, the positive sign and the negative sign will cancel, so I'll be left with one minus sine squared theta. And same thing over here, if I FOIL that out, I end up with one minus sine squared theta. Since they both have the same denominator now, we can combine them. So you've got the first numerator plus the second numerator, but because it's plus, the signs are not gonna change. So it's one plus one, which is one. And positive sine theta plus a negative sine theta means they're gonna cancel. And so I literally only get one plus one, which is two, and then the denominator stays the same. Then I did the Pythagorean theorem turning one into sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. The sine squared theta is cancel. I get two over cosine squared theta. This can be written as two times one over cosine squared theta, which can be written as two times one over cosine theta squared, which can be written as two secant theta squared, which is the same as saying two secant squared theta. Okay, and so then that is what we end up with. So this fraction, these adding subtractions, turns out to equal just two secant theta. Um, and so that's what we would put there for that problem. So these problems are kind of open-ended. They're starting you off with something, and then you're just supposed to see where you end up by following their directions. So we've got one more like that, and then we'll jump into the kind of problems you're gonna see in your homework, okay? So, and there are problems um, like these. So like number three and number four ask you to multiply by a well-chosen one. Two and five ask me to get a common denominator because they were two separate fractions. 
Um, number three, um, there was something that you could factor. And so that's the other strategy. The strategy is to factor. If you can factor things, then you're, to, you're um, advised to factor. So for me, um, you could have done this problem differently, honestly. You could have, instead of converting, because I saw sines and cosines down here. So I wanted to get the numerator in terms of sines and cosines as well. Um, so what I did was is I got rid of the one and threw in sines and cosines by using the Pythagorean identity. And then that canceled out the cosine squared B. So I ended up with just sine squared B in the numerator. In the denominator, I factored out that sine B and then the sine B here, one of them up there cancel and I end up with this, right? Another thing you could have done was just purely factor. If I factored the numerator, I would have done the difference of squares. So one minus cosine V and one plus cosine V. And then if I factor the denominator, I get sine V and then one plus cosine V. And then this cancels this and I end up with one minus cosine V over sine V. Now, if we look at what we had done earlier, we proved that those two things are equivalent to each other. Look here, when I did it one way, I got sine V over one plus cosine V, and that's this here. It's just they replaced theta with V. And as we were doing our manipulation, we ended up with this just before we split the fraction, which is exactly what I got when I did it the other way, by pure factoring, okay? Um, and so be careful with this problem because I needed to follow the direction. This method would have been incorrect. The computer would not have accepted this as the answer because they would have known that in order for me to get this answer, I would have had to have applied the Pythagorean theorem, and that is not what they expected me to do. They wanted me to factor the numerator and denominator and then simplify. So I had to do it this way, factoring the numerator and then factoring the denominator and then canceling, simplifying that fraction. So this is what the computer would have accepted. Um, even though these are equivalent, based on example one, I know they're equivalent. They're both good answers, but one of them is following the directions and the other one isn't, okay? So be careful with that, especially like when it comes to the review and the test. Make sure you're following your directions, okay? Um, so the other kind of problems that we'll see. So we have three strategies are to, um, and there's four total actually. There's one strategy which is to multiply by a well-chosen one, that's nice, is to um, get multiple fractions as one giant fraction and then simplify. Um, we also have a factoring as a, as a strategy. Um, we even have a strategy of getting everything in terms of sine and cosine. And that's usually my, my go-to so it's usually the first thing I do. If I see secants and tangents and cotangents and cosecants, those things, the first thing I do is I'm going to take that and I'm going to put them into sines and cosines. Because generally, once you do that, a bunch of stuff will cancel, some stuff will get manipulated a little bit, and then eventually you'll be able to get down to what you needed to get down to. You'll be able to simplify it so it looks a lot nicer and prettier and cleaner. Um, and so that's exactly what they're going to want us to do. Now notice that this one's different. They didn't give me this and then just tell me to simplify. They told me establish this identity. So they're telling us that this left hand side equals this right hand side. They want you to basically prove that, okay? So they want you to start with one of the sides, whether you start with this one or this one, and then show that if you manipulate it enough, you can get what's on the other side, okay? Now for this problem, they did specifically tell me to take this expression and manipulate it and then figure out how I'm going to get secant, okay? They already told me which one to take. I'm telling you when you're doing the problems, if they don't give you any directions on how to establish it, you should be taking the more complicated thing and then doing what you can do to it to get the other side, okay? It's much easier to go from the complicated thing and simplify down to the simpler expression than it is to take the simpler expression and then somehow get the more complicated expression okay 
So for me personally, if I was given this problem, I would have already taken the left-hand side and I would have broken these things down after distributing it, of course, I would have broken this down into cosine over sine, this one into sine over cosine. Then here the sines cancel, you get cosine theta by itself. Here you just get sine squared over cosine. I need the two fractions, right? This is like over one. I need to get a common denominator. So I multiplied the cosine over one by cosine over cosine so that they could have the same denominator when I was done. I got cosine squared over cosine and sine squared over cosine. Now that they have the same denominator, we can write them together as one big fraction over cosine. Um, and the numerator becomes cosine squared theta and sine squared theta. Now, um, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is one. And then one over cosine is secant. And now I've arrived what, what is on the right hand side, so I'm done. Just want to make you aware, um, addition is commutative. So it doesn't matter whether I have sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta or cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. Both of these are equivalent to one. So even though those were the other way around, because addition is commutative, I could make the conclusion that that would also equal one. Now, let's look at another example. So this one says, establish the identity that this equals this. Now, in example one, we already took the right-hand side, the fraction, and converted it over to the left-hand side. If I go back to example one right now, I will show you. So we already had sine theta over one plus cosine theta, and we manipulated it, and right before we got to the very last step, or actually, no, it's this cosecant. We did end up getting cosecant theta minus cotangent theta after all of our manipulation. So we've already done from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. What I wanted to do was show you what I would have done if I had been given this problem and had never done this in example one, okay? So what I would have done is I would have looked at this. And as soon as I see things that are not sines and cosines, my brain would have automatically gone to those and put it in sines and cosines. That's my go-to strategy, okay? So that's exactly what I did here. Since we already did it going one way, why not show the other way, right? Um, it doesn't make a difference whether you start with the right-hand side and you get to the left, or you start with the left and eventually you get to the right. That is the goal though, to start with one of those sides, manipulate it, and then get to the left-hand side, okay? Um, so what do we got here? We have um, left-hand side is cosecant is one over sine, cotangent is cosine over sine. They do have a common denominator already, so I just wrote them as a one fraction. That was one of the strategies, right, to write them as one fraction. Um, but I noticed that this wasn't going to get me anywhere. I'm not going to be able to just switch it, right? I need to be able to figure out how I'm going to get there. Um, I believe, let me check something. We already did establish that those are equivalent, that this is going to equal this because of this theorem, this, uh, problem over here, but I'm going to do it just because. So another strategy was to apply conjugant, right? That was a strategy. But remember what the goal is of a conjugant. When you apply the conjugant, it's because you're going to eventually use the Pythagorean identity. So if I'm gonna use the Pythagorean identity, I know that this sign is eventually going to cancel with that Pythagorean identity once I'm all done with it. So yes, I do wanna multiply by the conjugant of the numerator, and I did top and bottom, right? And I foiled this out and canceled the like terms and I got one minus cosine squared theta. But notice I did not distribute that denominator, okay? And unlike the other problem, you cannot distribute this and then somehow peel it apart again later like I did with the numerator. So for here, I really have to foresee that this is eventually gonna turn into signs and so don't distribute that in. You want to keep it factored because only factors can cancel factors. You cannot have terms canceling with terms. I cannot have this one and this one cancel or that cosine and that cosine cancel. It does not work that way, okay? Only factors with factors. So something that is multiplied by something else can factor with something that is multiplied by something else. 
okay? So here, what I did was I used the Pythagorean identity and I changed this one into sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. Cosine squared theta is canceled. I ended up with sine squared theta. This is sine theta times sine theta. So these are factors. So I can cancel one of these signs with one of those signs, leaving me with one left over, okay? Um, so I end up with sine over one plus cosine theta, which is exactly what I was trying to get. So we're done establishing that identity. Now, same thing with the number six we're trying to establish. Personally, my, my advice to you is to take the more complicated thing, mess with that, to try to get the simpler thing. So immediately I see all of this and I'm like, whoa, that's a lot of stuff going on there. That's what I want to start with, okay? So first thing I did was I just said the left-hand side is this. I didn't really do anything. I just rewrote it. Um, then what I did is I tried to convert the non-sine and cosine stuff into sines and cosines. So tangent turned into sine over cosine. Cotangent turned into cosine over sine. I did want to get these as one single fractions, right? So I went ahead and multiplied sine squared by cosine over cosine so they could both have cosine at the bottom. And when I was done, I had sine squared cosine theta minus sine theta. At the bottom, I multiplied by sine theta over sine theta so they could both have sine theta at the bottom. And then I ended up with cosine squared theta sine theta minus cosine theta. Now, once I had this, I noticed that I had what's called a, um, complex fraction. So you have like a fraction on top of a fraction. Whenever you have that, that numerator, and this is a division symbol divided by your divisor, I just changed it. Instead of it looking like a fraction, I wrote it like an expression like this. But we know that when we have expressions like that, we always do the numerator times the reciprocal of the denominator. That's how, you that's how you divide fractions. You don't ever actually divide, you multiply by the reciprocal. So that's exactly what I did, is I took this numerator and wrote it down exactly as it was, and then put the reciprocal of the denominator and then changed it to multiplication. So then here I got this times this, and here I got this times this, but it looks like before I did that, I factored out a sign. So I took this and I factored out a sign, so there's my sign, and I would have still a sign left and this cosine. And then if I factor out that sign, I'm just gonna have one. And then this time sign is still here, time sign. At the bottom, I have the cosine there in the times, and then I factor out a cosine here. So I took a cosine out of there, which means I still had one left, and I still had this sign left, minus when I took out that cosine, I have a one. But then I had sine, cosine, minus one, cosine, sine, minus one. Multiplication is also commutative, right? So sine, cosine is the same thing as cosine, sine. So these guys will cancel because those factors do match. And what happens is I end up with sine squared theta over cosine squared theta. And then if I rewrite that differently, I can say sine over cosine squared, which means the same thing as saying tangent squared which is the same as saying tan squared theta. And that is what we have on the right-hand side, so we did establish that identity. Now, other than those strategies, those are basically it. Multiplying by clever one, um, using conjugates if you need to, factoring if you need to, getting one single fraction if you need to, and then putting things in terms of sines and cosines whenever you can, okay? Those are our strategies. So for an example, I noticed that this is a little bit different. It gave us specific directions for number six. It said, multiply this and simplify it. And so I had to do exactly as they told me. So I went ahead and I multiplied these two binomials out. So it's one minus the result that I get for multiplying these out. So that's why I used a bracket there so that I remember that I'm supposed to subtract everything I get from that expression. So cosine and cosine, cosine squared, cosine and sine, cosine, sine, sine and cosine, sine, cosine, and sine squared. Uh, negative and negative is positive sine squared. These two are like terms. Um, I think what I did was, is I distributed the negative next. So I distributed that negative. So this became negative cosine squared 
We do have commutative property of multiplication, so it doesn't matter what order they're in. Um, this can be written as sine cosine, and that negative and negative become positive, negative and negative become positive, negative and positive become negative. And so then when I combine my like terms, uh, before I do that, I change this to sine squared plus cosine squared, brought down my minus cosine squared. I did combine these guys. There's one here, one there. That means I have two sine theta cosines. And then I brought down my minus sine squared. Sine squared minus sine squared cancel. Cosine squared minus cosine squared cancels. So all I have left is my numerator, sine theta cosine theta over two sine theta cosine theta. Sines cancel, cosines cancel. I'm still left with the one coefficient over two, which means I get one half. This little notation over here is just to make sure you know what commutative means. So commutative means that it doesn't matter the order that you perform your operation, the value is still the same. So addition is commutative and multiplication are commutative. So you can always rearrange your terms and it's still an equivalent um, expression. And when you're doing a product, you can always uh, switch over the terms like I did here and it's still equivalent. Um, subtraction, however, is not equivalent and neither is division. So these guys are not commutative. You can't just flip them over, switch them around, and it's the same. You just totally change the value when you switch them around and flip them over, okay? So be careful with that. Only multiply and addition are commutative. Now, this example, um, this is all that they gave me, and I believe they may or may not have told me to use factoring strategy. But since I have a, basically a quadratic in terms of sine and a quadratic in terms of sine, I went ahead and factored that. That's what stuck out to me. Like if I've got a quadratic, I want to factor this thing. So then I factored it. And when I factored it, I ended up with three sine theta plus one, two sine theta plus one, sine theta plus one, two sine theta plus one. These two guys do cancel, leaving me with three sine theta plus one over sine theta plus one. And that was all they asked me to do, so that's all I did. I didn't try to manipulate this any further by doing conjugates and all of that stuff. I just left it alone and the computer accepted it. So um, just make sure you're following your directions on these. And if you're not sure how to factor that, um, remember that you can go way back, right? And do your um, substitution. So you can say like, let X equal sine of theta then that numerator will become 6x because it's sine squared, which would mean x squared, plus 5 sine theta is just x plus 1 over 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. If you don't know how to factor these really quickly, you can use the AC method for both the numerator and the denominator. Now, these, all of this does take some time. So, I didn't do it, I just, I know how to factor, and I know how to factor even if um, it's a quadratic form, I still know how to factor. And so I'm able to do this, but if you're out of practice with doing that, um, then you do have the alternative to do some side work before you get here. Um, so AC method would be six times one, which is six, and then you come up with the factors that give you six. Um, there we go. That. Add to give you six, but combine to give you five. That would be two and three. So this becomes six x squared plus two x plus three x plus one. These two guys have a two x in common, leaving me with three x plus one. Have to bring down the plus sign. These have nothing in common, so you put a one and you still end up with three x plus one. So the binomial they have in common is three x plus one, and that leaves me with two x plus one. And then you just back up. So remember, x is sine of theta. So this is three sine of theta plus one, and then two sine of theta plus one, right? And that's how I did the numerator. I did this in my head, but if you can't, do it on paper, right? Um, and then similarly, you can do the same thing for the other one. So two times one is two. How am I gonna get three? Only two times one, right? So we're gonna get um, sine, two sine, or not two sine, two x. So we have two x squared plus um, two x plus one x plus one. So this side has a two in common, 
a two and an X in common. So if I factor out that two X, I end up with X and a one, bring down my plus sign. These have nothing in common, so bring out a one. It stays X plus one. They have X plus one in common, and then you have two X plus one left over. And if you back sub, that's the same as saying sine theta plus one and two sine theta plus one. So again, I did all of that, but I didn't write it down, so I just factored it. Now, if you're that great at factoring, perfect. This is literally all you need to show, cancel, cancel, and then you get the answer. If you're not great at factoring, please go through all the steps to make sure you factor this thing correctly. The last thing you want to do is be getting all the wrong answers because you're not factoring it correctly, okay? So the last problem that I noticed um, was an establishing the identity. And so, oh, this one does involve the odds and evens. So there is one that I've saw so far. So this one, I am taking the more complicated side, which is the left-hand side. And then instead of writing cotangent squared, I wrote cotangent of what's in the parentheses, the whole thing squared, right? Because that's how I type it in my computer. Then I use the even odd identity for cotangent. I noticed that here it says cotangent of a negative angle is negative cotangent of the positive angle. So it's literally what I did right there is I just used that even odd identity. Then I went ahead and squared it. Well, what's a negative cotangent times a negative cotangent? It's a positive cotangent squared. So that's where I got this from. And then if you look at the um, Pythagorean identities, one plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. And so I applied that identity here and I got cosecant squared. And that is what was on the right-hand side so I am done establishing that particular identity. So from here to here, I did use the even odd identities, right? And then from here to here, I use the Pythagorean identities. Okay, if you can justify how you're going from one step to the other, then that's how you know your proof is like perfect, okay? Here and here, all I did was square. All I did was square negative cotangent theta. I didn't do anything other than just algebra, right? Negative, a square means that thing times itself, and I've just multiplied that thing times itself, okay? So if you can write things like that, this is what I'm doing in each step, more chances are you're going to make sure that you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be doing because you know what you're doing. Um, and then therefore your answer will be the correct answer. But that's it for 8.4. It's just establishing identity. So manipulation, manipulation, manipulation with all of these expressions. To be honest, this is the most fun section for me. Um, we will come back to this. This will get more complicated. We will have to establish more identities as we learn more formulas. Um, and so it will come back, but you've got to get this down. I promise you there's going to be some on the test. Um, this is really, really a big one, especially when you get to calculus and you get an answer and then the back of the book has a completely different answer. You're going to have to know how to show if you want to know whether or not you got it correct and you don't get the exact same answer as what's in the back of the book, you're going to have to manipulate your answer to look like the one in the back of the book. That way you know whether or not they are equivalent or not, okay? So it's very, very helpful to know how to manipulate trigonometric um, expressions. You really need to get that down because otherwise you're just gonna think every problem you do in calculus is wrong. And it might not be that you, your calculus is wrong. It might just be that you're not recognizing that your answer is equivalent to the answer in the back of the book, okay? Or if you're using a program, that your answer is equivalent to the answer that's in the program. It keeps telling you, no, this is not what we want. No, this is not what we want. You need to be able to manipulate yours to give them what they want, okay? So very, very important section here. It will come back to you in calculus, I promise. So please, please, please practice this one so you get it down with all those strategies, okay?